In this lecture, we're going to be talking about stock warrants. A stock warrant is a right to purchase stock at a future date at a predetermined price. Stock warrants are a little bit different than conversions. On a conversion, the holder would forfeit another security in order to receive back the stock. Uh, in this case, and we're talking about this particular topic, uh, the person doesn't actually forfeit the other security, but they do have to pay cash to exercise their option. Uh, the cash hopefully uh, allows them to purchase uh, stock at a predetermined price that's a discount from the ongoing market price. And so the person could essentially exercise the option and then turn around and sell that same share out in the secondary market um, and make, make a, an instant profit. There are two types of stock warrants. There are detachable and non-detachable stock warrants. A detachable stock warrant is one where the warrant can be traded or exercised independently from the security that it was originally issued with. A non-detachable stock warrant means that it cannot, and in that case, it would be much like a bond conversion. All right, let's walk through an example. On January 1st, 2018, a firm issues $800,000 in 7% annual bonds. The par value of each bond is $1,000, and the firm raises $820,000 from the issuance. Each bond includes eight warrants to purchase the firm's common stock. The exercise price for each warrant is $25 per share. An investment bank estimates that the value of each bond without the warrant is 98% of the par value, and each warrant has a fair value of $6.50. On November 30, 2019, 5,500 of the warrants are exercised and the firm issues new shares to satisfy the contract. At the same or at the time the warrants are exercised, the market price for the stock is $30. I provide that information, but ultimately that information is not relevant to the problem. And then finally, the remaining warrants expire on December 31st, 2022. And then finally, the par value of the firm's common stock is $1 per share. Okay, as we walk through the example, the first thing the firm has to do is bifurcate or separate the, pro the proceeds from the issuance to the bonds themselves and the stock warrants that are attached or that are detachable from the bonds. Uh, and so the first step in doing this is to calculate the fair value of each item. The fair value of the bonds were quoted as 98% of the par value, or $784,000. The fair value of the stock warrants were quoted as $6.50 per warrant. There are eight warrants for each bond, and of course there are 800 bonds that are part of the issuance. And so the total fair value of all stock warrants is $41,600. So the total fair value of both of them together is $825,600. The second step in separating the proceeds is then to allocate the uh, proceeds based on their relative fair value. And so we would allocate to the bonds uh, basically this ratio, their portion of the total fair value. And so of course we're allocating the $820,000 that were raised and the proportion that would be allocated to the bonds is $784,000 out of $825,600 for a total of $778,682. This is the amount that would be allocated to the bonds. And so that does imply that the bonds were issued at a discount. Since the, since the par value is 800,000. And then secondly, then we would allocate uh, the, the sort of the remaining amount to the stock warrants in sort of a similar approach, the proceeds of 820,000. And then we multiply that by the proportion of the total fair value that we attribute to the stock warrants. And so we would allocate $41,318 to the stock warrants. And so the initial journal entry, the cash proceeds of 820000 the bonds payable with its associated discount, of course we see those two items together, and finally the amount that we allocate to the stock warrants. And the account that we're going to use is paid in capital stock warrants. Notice that the bond issuance is very similar to things we've already done. The difference here, of course, that, uh, is that the stock warrants are also being issued in conjunction with the bonds. So uh, as long as uh, the bonds were outstanding, the firm would record the interest expense and bond interest payments just like any other bonds payable. We're not going to really cover that here because I've covered that in other lectures and everything is exactly the same. But we do need to record when stock warrants are exercised or when they expire. And so that's new to this lecture and so that's where we're going to spend a little more time. 
And so if they are exercised, the warrant holder must return the stock warrant and the firm receives the predetermined price for the shares. In other words, they'll receive, basically the holder gives up that right and they also have to pay cash. The second piece, of course, is if they are exercised, the firm will issue new shares or they could have reissued treasury shares to satisfy the contractual obligation to provide the shares. If the, if the stock warrants were to expire, then the contribution from the original issuance gets reclassified into an expired stock warrant, and that allows us to distinguish from warrants that are still outstanding. All right, so to our example at hand, uh, there were several uh, stock warrants that were exercised on November 30th, 2019. The cash that's received was, of course, based on the, the predetermined price of $25 per share. And there are 5,500 shares that are going to be issued uh, when these warrants are exercised. And so the firm will receive $137,500. Of course, they do also exercise those warrants, and so they're giving up that, that right uh, by exercising them. And so what we have to end up doing is we have to figure out, well, what is the fair value that we assign to all the stock warrants? And then we have to basically get a fair value per stock warrant. So in this case, there were a total of 6,400 stock warrants, and the allocation was $41,318, which means we've allocated $6.46 to each stock warrant. And so based on the 5,500 that were exercised, we'd have to record a $35,530 uh, debit to the stock warrant account. And so when we finally record the, the stock warrants being exercised, of course, we already calculated the cash amount and we've calculated the debit to the stock warrant account. And so we have those two debits and the common stock account gets credited for the par value of $1 per share and any amount above par gets assigned to additional paid in capital common stock. And then uh, later on down the line, the remaining stock warrants expire. And so we have to figure out, well, what's the remaining balance? And so, of course, the original balance was $41,318. Uh, $35,530 of those had been exercised, which means that the balance uh, remaining in the stock warrant account was $5,788 when those stock warrants expired. And it's pretty straightforward. We just, again, reclassify that paid-in capital from the uh, stock warrant account, which represents outstanding options. Uh, instead, we reallocate it to this permanent expired account called uh, paid-in capital expired stock warrants.